Our first speaker today will dive into the evolving challenges impacting international supply chains in 2024 from the perspective of one of the world's biggest logistics organizations. AP Mollemersk's supply chain world encompasses over 130 countries, more than 100,000 employees, in excess of 100,000 customers, over 700 container vessels, and 7 million square meters of warehouse capacity across 450 sites as it processes over 3 billion online business events annually. As global head of business resilience consulting at Maersk, Zira Zheng has played a pivotal role in enhancing the company's business and supply chain resilience, leading the development of the Maersk supply chain resilience model. In her presentation, Zira is going to integrate the observations from the 2023 risk trends with the developments of 2024, identifying key vulnerabilities and emerging threats across geopolitics, climate, regulatory environments, labor markets, and cyber security. She's also going to discuss developing a comprehensive strategy for safeguarding supply chains against the complexities of today's global landscape. Please join me in welcoming Zira to the stage. Zira, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Zira Chen, uh, leading the Resilience uh, Consulting at Maersk. Uh, it's an honor uh, to open the second day of a uh, TAPA EMEA event, and also I appreciate uh, the opportunity to kick off uh, today's uh, sessions. Uh, the title of my uh, presentation uh, is uh, Masking Global Supply Chain Risks, Navigating Through a Unique Year uh, of uh, Disruptions. 2024 has indeed a year like no other, uh, accurate the theme of uh, this event. Uh, in this um, post-COVID era, the landscape of uh, business and logistics is uh, rapidly evolving. Uh, with uh, increased uncertainties and also fast-paced uh, changes, especially this year. Today, I will guide you through uh, the key risk confronting uh, supply chain, uh, emerging trends, and also the effective uh, strategies uh, for mitigating uh, these risks. Also, uh, I will share a MERSC case study uh, to illustrate our approach uh, in action. Uh, finally, I will also provide a brief overview of um, how we uh, manage security and the business resilience and the MERSC, covering both our global setup and the specific uh, measures uh, in Europe. Um, before we dive in, uh, let me briefly introduce myself. Uh, I've been working over 16 years uh, in risk management and the logistic industry assisting uh, MERSC uh, uh, in, the, uh, in several crises and uh, contingency management uh, through these uh, critical events, such as uh, COVID, uh, the Suez Canal blockage, uh, if you remember, uh, and also the Ukraine-Russia uh, conflict. Uh, in my current role, uh, I provide uh, a resilience consulting uh, to MERSC clients, uh, but also leading the development of uh, MERSC uh, resilient uh, products. Uh, my contributions and, uh, also extend to uh, international and uh, national forums, uh, including serving as an uh, expert uh, uh, reviewer for the NTAC, the UNCTAD uh, Port uh, Resilience and Guidebook. Uh, also recently, I participated in the NTAC Forum, uh, Global Supply Chain Forum, discussing about the supply chain resilience for food and the uh, seas country, the small island developing state countries. Uh, I've also co-authored co some articles uh, for the uh, World Economic Forums on the dynamic situations in the Red Sea region, uh, which also you can find on the uh, uh, WEF, uh, and also uh, contributed to several MERSC um, key publications, uh, including the Customer Insight and the Blue Papers on the theme of uh, supply chain risks and the resilience, uh, where you can also find uh, on the MERSC.com. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here um, today among the so many experts in security and the resilience. Also, I'm quite active on LinkedIn, uh, where I regularly share the weekly uh, supply chain risks, uh, the emerging supply chain risks uh, to help a professional and organizations 
uh, stay ahead in a volunteer world. So also welcome uh, to connect me there. I hear here also I shared my LinkedIn uh, contact information. So let's uh, now explore the why behind our conversation today. The critical roles of understanding supply chain risks. Uh, since the onset of uh, COVID-19, uh, the business uh, landscape has, a force, uh, has a faced a complex array of uh, uncertainties and the volat uh, uh, volatilities, ranging from geopolitics shifts uh, to extreme weather events. Disruptions are now once uh, seem unpredictable, and now patterns we can anticipate and uh, prepare for. For example, how many of you had foreseen the Panama Canal drought last year? Well, if you were aware of the drought, its recurring risk to Panama Canal and understood its uh, implications to your business, would you be in a better position to be prepared for such kind of uh, disruptions? As illustrated in the diagram here, the more we know about the existing and emerging risk, the better equipped we are to handle them. And this knowledge doesn't just help us to manage a crisis, it also enables us to navigate through them more effectively and confidently. Stay informed about supply chain risk is essential. It's about the readiness in a domain where disruptions are inevitable. The, mo uh, the most uh, prepared organization do more than s uh, survive, but thrive. They transform these uh, challenges into valuable opportunities. Indeed, every crisis presents a dual challenges, a threat or uh, uh, opportunities. It is our anticipations and the response to these uh, risks that carve our path forward. As we dive into the involving uh, supply chain risk of uh, 2024, it's crucial to reflect on the legacy uh, left by 2023, a year marked a complex mosaic of uh, challenges that have set the stage for the issues we are tackling today. First, let's uh, look at the extreme weather events. Remember the Panama Canal drought? That was just at the beginning. We've also seen reduced water uh, levels in major rivers like uh, Rhine River in Germany, Yangtze River in China, and also uh, the Amazon uh, in Brazil. That's all happened in 2023. Which, uh, and also added to uh, that the wildfires that has, uh, swept through Canada, North America, and Australia, as well as over 10 significant uh, typhoons in the Asia Pacific regions. These uh, nature disasters have caused uh, disruptions that extend far beyond the logistic, but also affecting societies at large. These events are not just one-offs. They are a warning of what 2024 can, uh, could bring to us. Also, second, you can see the labor dynamics come to the forefront as a criti uh, critical issue. From the U.S. and West Coast to the street of Dhaka, Bangladesh, workers have been demanding higher wages in response to the soaring cost of a living, leading to the strike that ripple across the se all sectors. And then there's the undercurrent of a geopolitical unrest, ongoing conflicts like uh, those involving Ukraine and Russia, as well as uh, Israel and Hamas, continue to reshape the, the global uh, supply chains the landscape, impacting everything from energy suppliers to the commodity uh, markets. Together, these uh, three forces, extreme weather, labor dynamics, and the geopolitical uh, unrest form a triad of uh, turbulence. They are the backdrop against which we must navigate, adapt, and seek opportunities for resilience and the growth in 2024. As we turn the page to focus on the ongoing year, we comfort a diverse and intricate set of uh, supply chain risks. Let's explore these uh, critical areas uh, that demand our attention and strategic action. First, geopolitical risks. 
2024 continues and to be shaped by intense uh, geopolitical tensions. We are not only monitoring ongoing conflicts like the, the Russia-Ukraine situations and the tensions in the Red Sea region, but also we are keeping a close watch on the global political climate. With the key elections on the horizon, the outcomes will undoubtedly influence existing geopolitical uh, dynamics and the trade policies. Second, regulatory risks. We are witness a surge in regulatory risks. In an era where geopolitics and economic policies are deeply interwined, governments are increasingly proactive in shaping industry landscape. The trend towards greater state involvement is the most evident in the push for sustainable and resilient supply chains. Thirdly, climate risk continues to loom large. The, uh, the persistent effects of uh, El Nino uh, challenges us with uh, extreme weather conditions, while the potential shift to La Nina later this year may further disrupt our ability, uh, uh, abilities to plan and prepare. It's vital that we enhance our capabilities to respond to these uh, climate variations swiftly and effectively. Labor risk. Labor dynamics uh, are dramatically turbulent with industry uh, actions and also negotiations uh, causing significant uh, disruptions at a major logistic hub uh, worldwide. The demands on the uh, fair uh, wages for, uh, in response to these uh, rising living costs continue to echo globally, impacting operations across all sectors. Cybersecurity risk as a technology advance, so do the risk associated with its uh, malicious use. We are seeing a rise in AI-directed uh, attacks and the sophisticated cyber threat uh, target the supply chains and the critical infrastructures. Uh, this is also uh, necessitate a robust security measures. We will take a closer look at each of uh, these areas in the following, exploring uh, how they are currently uh, impact our operations and how we can strategic, uh, strategically address them. As we pivot to a detailed look at the geopolitical risk, it's clear that the landscape of 2024 is deeply influenced by the residue tensions of the past year. This year is an unprecedented in its political activities with over 40 parliamentary and presidential elections around the globe affecting regions that, uh, that represent 41 percentage of a uh, world's population and 42 percentage of an, its um, GDP. Now this number is uh, getting even larger recently uh, because of the uh, this, uh, dissolutions of uh, British and the French Parliament, uh, as you probably see the news recently. Uh, why are these uh, elections uh, crucial for supply chains? Each election uh, could pivotally shift the trade policies, market access, and also the economic uh, stability. From the first picture, Bangladesh, the Prime Minister, uh, Shikha Hasina, has uh, successfully uh, re-elected uh, for uh, her fourth term uh, this year and uh, continue her 15-year ruling uh, amid of uh, the turmoil. Uh, including the protest uh, this year uh, from the opposition parties and also the government sectors, government workers. The government sector in Bangladesh, as you probably know, contributes to 11 percentage of a uh, country GDP and involving over 4.4 million people there. So, and also they demand for higher minimum uh, wages right before the elections. Then the government made the decisions to increase the wages by 56 percentage. Uh, this is also to temporarily stabilize uh, the situations over there during the elections. But also you can imagine to uh, the companies who are sourcing, uh, uh, sourcing these uh, governments and out of uh, Bangladesh, 
they actually uh, significantly impact by uh, these uh, increasing labor costs. Second picture is in Taiwan. The elections uh, have urged in a pro-independency uh, leadership, escalating uh, regional tensions and also presenting uh, strategic concerns for Venice with interest in this uh, voluntary regime. Um, and uh, also, this is uh, further compounded by the recent uh, military development and also the drills, as you probably see from the, the, from the news. Pakistan and Indonesia, uh, these countries are critical for sourcing essential uh, minerals like uh, lithium, copper, cobalt, and nickel. The political stance of uh, the new leadership will be pivotal for industry relying on these uh, raw material, particular the battery productions and also maybe the automotive uh, vehicle, uh, automotive industry. European Parliament, as you see the pictures uh, at the uh, right, at, at the uh, left side, um, the recent result also showing the shift toward more right-leaning uh, representations. This also could potentially lead to substantial policy changes affecting immigration, uh, diplomatic relationships, uh, trade tariffs, and the regulatory attitudes toward the sustainability, technology, and the data privacy uh, in the following. And the, the biggest one of the year, elections of the year, the US uh, general elections. Uh, this will for sure uh, give a global, uh, greater global implications. Uh, this will uh, potentially influence the regional conflict stance, uh, trade policies, especially concerning China, and the initiatives also on uh, environmental sustainability. The result will affect these areas, this topic potentially. So in this uh, post-COVID era, a clear trend is emerging where governments prioritize national interests leading to significant uh, interventions in trade and economic uh, policies. The political completion of uh, key uh, economic players, including US, the European Union, and also China, will eventually shape global industries' uh, strategies in the following. Regulatory risk. In 2024, the landscape of uh, regulatory risk requires our uh, vigilant attention. These regulations are not just requirements, but are significant forces that are reshaping the global uh, business environment. Post-COVID, governments across the globe uh, are increasingly asserting their uh, influence, enacting robust policies that prioritize the national uh, interest and the resilience of uh, critical industries. This is uh, clearly reflected in the initiatives like uh, uh, US uh, Supply Chain Resilience Act and also for the UK's uh, strategy on the critical imports and the supply chains, uh, which aim to define and uh, secure reli a reliable source for these essential goods and materials. A key area uh, of a focus is also on the ESG, uh, the Environmental, Social and uh, Governance Standards especially within the European Union. The EU's uh, emission uh, trading system, the ETS, has expanded to include the marine time emissions uh, starting from uh, January 1st this year. This is part of the ways for the implementations of a carbon uh, border adjustment mechanism, uh, CBAM. Moreover, uh, Germany also this, uh, announced their supply chain act that's put into enforcement uh, this was also put in the st uh, strict uh, sustainability and the labor compliance requirement across both direct and indirect suppliers. This will also reshape global supply chain dynamics. The EU's uh, proposed corporate social uh, due diligence directive in abbreviation CSDDD stands to further revolutionize corporate responsibility. 
if this thing's being um, enacted, it would uh, compel European companies uh, and also their global subsidiaries to adhere to these uh, sustainable, uh, sustainability uh, practice. So, which also means the European companies are here, most of you, not just uh, your uh, office in Europe have to comply with that, but also your uh, offices and your factories globally also need to comply with that requirement. So the overarching theme uh, in this uh, regulatory shift uh, is uh, moving toward greater uh, transparency and uh, sustainability within supply chains. Business are now required to not only identify their direct suppliers, but also need to map out and understand their entire supply network, which often extend beyond the second tier uh, suppliers. This level of uh, traceability and uh, compliance readiness demands sophisticated tools and the technology to achieve that. So the takeaway here is uh, very clear. The transparency and the sustainability in supply chains are no longer merely advantages, but are imperative. Companies must proactively integrate these uh, regulations into their business models to effectively navigate this involving regulatory landscape. Climate risk, the impact of El Nino, which intensified in 2023, continues uh, to pose significant uh, challenges into 2024. The US and National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, has uh, projected uh, these conditions persist until May 2024 this year. You might be wondering about uh, the real world implications of uh, this uh, phenomenon. For instance, the typical one, the El Nino induced drought has severely impacted the Panama Canal. The low water levels in Garden Lake have uh, forced the Canal Authority to implement uh, the draft restrictions on the vessels. This is leads to disruptions in global shipping routes. These conditions initially expect to improve uh, according to the normal weather patterns in the Panama Canal, but unfortunately, it has a persistent into the new year, into uh, first quarter of this year. This is also aligned with uh, NOAA's uh, predictions of an extended El Nino period. Also in Brazil, the port of uh, Manaus has been uh, seeing significantly uh, operational uh, disruptions this year. Further, uh, wildfires in regions like uh, Canada and Australia uh, directly correlate with the drought conditions that fostered by El Nino. NASA and also the uh, World uh, Meteorological Organization, WMO, warned that the temperature may soar even higher this year, compounding these challenges. But what happens after El Nino's subsidies, right? La Nina is anticipated to begin in September with a 77 percentage of probability. This climate shift is expected to bring its own set of challenges including a significant increase in hurricane activity along the U.S. East Coast this year, with projections of uh, 33 hurricanes during the upcoming season, uh, far ex exceeding uh, the average, yearly average of uh, 14 hurricanes on, on, on yearly basis. Additionally, regions like uh, South Africa may face increased uh, flood risk this year. Understanding these climate patterns is uh, crucial for our preparedness. By anticipating these uh, weather trends, we can better strategize and also mitigate uh, the disruptions. In a world that continue to be warmer and also have a more extreme weather, having foresight is not just an advantage, but also necessity. Labor risk. In 2023, labor strike 
were a major force of uh, disruptions across various uh, regions, including the US uh, West Coast and uh, Europe, impacting a range of industries. So what's the root cause of uh, this uh, strike? We believe a significant uh, tug of war between uh, stagnating uh, wages and uh, surge, uh, surging inflation rates. The graph I show here on the slides, uh, based on the data from the Economist and Intelligence Unit, EIU, uh, clearly illustrate uh, this. As you can see here, the widening gap between the real wages and the uh, consumer price uh, is uh, stark. Despite a gradual decline uh, in inflation, that's a good thing, uh, this, uh, this poverty persistent and also continues uh, to provoke uh, labor uh, unrest into 2024. A critical era, uh, area to monitor is the US and East Coast this year, where the looming expirations of the Dock Workers Collective Labor Agreement by end of September this year could potentially trigger strikes. Uh, this situation is uh, further complicated by the dynamics of an election year in the US, adding layers of uh, predictabilities to potential labor actions. The labor risk extended beyond the US. We are also uh, closely watching uh, Canada where negotiations uh, with uh, railway workers are ongoing. And also in Germany, where talks between the train drivers union, uh, GDL, and also Deutsche Bahn uh, uh, hopefully approaching a resolution. The impact is uh, limited uh, to uh, transportation and the logistics. Manufacturing sector also being uh, equally affected. For instance, like the examples I show here, Bangladesh, also the garment factories also uh, facing some uh, disruptions by the labor's uh, dispute as well. So looking ahead to the reminder of uh, 2024, we may still see significant labor-related turbulence. However, there's uh, some uh, optimism uh, behind that as uh, real wages begin to align more closely with uh, inflation, uh, a trend that we anticipated to uh, solidify in 2025, the, intens uh, the intensity of uh, these uh, disruptions may uh, diminish in 2025. Cybersecurity risk. Cybersecurity remains a paramount concern for supply chain leaders. A substantial 74 percentage of uh, CEOs are worried about their organization's uh, ability to prevent or minimize the damage from cyber attacks. This concern is underscored by the then a uh, ransom uh, trends report, which highlights an average operational downtime of uh, 3.4 weeks for impact companies. Furthermore, according to uh, IBM's uh, cost of uh, data breach report from 2023, the global average cost of a uh, data breach has uh, increased to 4.45 million US dollars per each accident. Looking to 2024, the cyber threat landscape continues to evolve. AI-directed attacks are becoming increasingly sophisticated and are targeting the supply chains and the critical infrastructures. These attacks can cause widespread and profound disruptions. Additionally, national state attacks and the hacktivism continue to complexify the cybersecurity environment with uh, efficient attacks also persisting, exploiting human errors to breach security uh, defenses. To mitigate these risks and their potential impacts, it's crucial we do more than just uh, elevate our defense using these uh, robust cybersecurity standards. We also emphasize contingency planning, ensuring the rapid data and the system restoration capabilities in the event of a breach. So let's use this uh, Q1 risk overview to examine um, the multi-phase uh, risks 
impacting the supply chain uh, across these uh, five key dimensions. I also encourage the audience here uh, to use this as a reference to perform a self and check to see if you are aware of uh, these risks. And also you can uh, if, uh, elevate, uh, 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 evaluate how, uh, whether this and uh, risks have affected your business. So we begin with the geopolitical tensions uh, that have uh, um, escalated following uh, recent uh, elections as well. As you see here, that uh, also in Q1, we are see, still seeing the ongoing Russia-Ukraine situations, the Red Sea crisis, and also we have uh, several countries and uh, complete uh, the, their general elections this year. And additionally, uh, in Myanmar, uh, the military uh, government also has uh, imposed the conscription laws um, in Q1 this year. This is actually bring the significant disruptions to the labor uh, supply market this year. On the regulatory front, uh, the EU emission trading system, the ETS, uh, has been implemented as anticipated. And the UK has announced the significant strategies regarding critical imports and the supply chains. Furthermore, the European Cyber Attack Regulation, also known as DORA, now uh, mandate uh, compliance with uh, student uh, data privacy uh, uh, and also the cyber security standards. This is also uh, interwinked uh, regulatory and the cyber risks. Climate-related challenges continue to be a significant concern with the improved uh, situations at the, the Panama Canal and also the emerging uh, water shortage in India uh, early this year, highlighting uh, the urgent need for uh, adaption strategies. Also, labor issues have been evidenced in, in various uh, sectors and regions, notably, uh, Starting from this year, and Australia has, uh, has seen port worker strikes at the DP World terminals. This uh, gives a huge disruption uh, to the cargoes in and out, uh, out of uh, Australia. And also uh, port uh, worker strikes uh, in France. This is a uh, continue, this is ongoing situations. They are against the, the, their pension uh, reform. And the aviation and the railway uh, strike is an also happened, have been seen in Germany. Marine time workers strike in Nigeria. Uh, Spain railway strikes also happened in uh, Q1 this year. Uh, in Finland, also we've seen port uh, workers strike. And also ongoing, we are still seeing the dispute uh, between the Canada railway unions and uh, uh, their national uh, railway operator, CN and uh, CKPC, uh, these are two companies. Um, and finally, cyber risk persistent uh, with uh, significant uh, disruptions as well, uh, such as the, the system outreach uh, early this year at the, the Mexico uh, National uh, Customs Agency. This is actually create uh, uh, some chaos for the uh, cross-border cargoes uh, between Mexico and the U.S. Uh, and also in Q1, I think it was around uh, March, uh, there's also uh, a, cyber uh, a cyber attack hitting uh, multiple uh, airports in uh, Denmark, including the Copenhagen uh, airport and also Aarhus airport. So uh, these events underscore the, the necessity of uh, uh, vigilant risk monitoring and uh, uh, forecasting. By staying informed and prepared, we can navigate these uh, challenges more effectively uh, throughout the rest of the, of the year. So about the, the mitigations. As we look ahead, it's crucial for all of us to be well, uh, well prepared for the potential disruptions. Here are our recommendations for mitigating the risks we face in 2024. Firstly, establish a robust risk monitoring mechanism. As the bullet point I show here, it's important that we have the internal channels to collect these disruptions that has been seen across the global. 
internally within the organization, you have to ensure you have the channels to collect these uh, uh, disruptions information in a timely manner. Second, also you have to establish the uh, reporting mechanism with your vendor, with your key suppliers to ensure that anything uh, that could disrupt your supply chain can be uh, informed, can be uh, communicated uh, to your side. So the entire organization have, uh, can adjust to the issues in a timely manner. And the third one in the, is um, also uh, very important, but sometimes be uh, neglected, is the integrations of uh, these, uh, inform all the information you collect. You can imagine for this uh, risk intelligence, you probably have uh, various uh, channels to collect this uh, risk intelligence from your supplier, from your internal organization, or maybe from external risk intelligence uh, uh, suppliers also. But uh, all these informations uh, come to your organization, whether there's uh, a standard procedure to verify the information, and also, in most important, to take actions on it, and uh, uh, also to share and uh, communicate to the relevant key stakeholders who need to be informed. The second uh, is uh, to identify the vulnerability and uh, develop the contingency plan. Uh, this is also included the three steps, three key points here. The first is uh, to identify uh, the supply chain risk, um, uh, is uh, to condu conduct uh, the supply chain risk assessment. Through this uh, step, you have to understand that uh, where you have the vulnerability, where you have the dependency uh, across your supply chain. And then based on that, you need to develop the contingency plan, preparing for in case you loss of these key dependency you have. And the third is also long term, you have to develop the supply chain strategies that's including increasing your flexibilities and also considering about these diversifications of your supply chain to mitigate the overall supply chain risk. Lastly, is uh, to develop a crisis management team structures. So first, uh, you need to have the, the crisis management team set up. This is also allows you to uh, engage the people who, need, uh, who can help to address the situations and handle the situations. And uh, this also uh, should be supported by a clear protocols uh, and also the communication channels. You need to have the procedures that aligned and agreed by all the relevant parties within your organization who might be involved in the crisis management and also being followed by them. And important, also uh, remember, practice uh, makes it perfect. So you have to also improve uh, the, the, the practice by having regular drills and uh, uh, also the trainings to keep them uh, understand and aware what exactly they need to do in case of a, a crisis. So by adopting these uh, measures, um, business will be in a good shape, uh, more confidently uh, relaxed uh, to uh, deal with uh, unexpected. This will also allow the business not only uh, protect uh, their operations, but also gain the agility uh, to capitalize on opportunities that arise even in times of uncertainty. Here I would like to, uh, in this slide, I would like to explore a real life a case study of uh, how MERSC uh, respond effectively to a crisis. The drought disruption at the Panama Canal, uh, as I mentioned a couple of times of, about this case. So let's uh, start from the eyes of uh, customers. As you probably know that the Panama Canal itself accounts to three percentage of uh, global ocean volumes. Uh, also, uh, which also means when the drought happens, actually also I would like to ask you, uh, encourage you to think about for the Panama Canal drought, when did you, when uh, were you aware of the situations? The Panama Canal was uh, probably got the tensions within uh, the business from August 2023, where all the key medias, including BBC, Bloomberg, Guardians, for, uh, Financial Times, uh, Reuters, uh, all reported the severe drought in the Panama Canal. Um, by that time, also the Panama Canal Authority 
uh, had announced uh, dramatic reductions on the vessel draft, uh, which can uh, transit through the Panama Canal. So during that period, it's got a lot of uh, media attention. The situations actually got uh, even worse um, in October, when the Panama Canal Authority start to reduce the, the transit slot for the vessels. Some vessels have to reroute by crossing the Atlantic Ocean instead of a uh, Trans-Pacific Ocean. Then in late November, December, we see the due impact by the Red Sea. Uh, these vessels previously was uh, crossing the Atlantic Ocean. They have to further reroute around the Cape of uh, Good Hope. So which means that to give a significant impact on the total uh, lead time, transit time for the ocean, uh, for the shippings. So this is uh, the timeline usually we see from uh, the, the market or the most of the business side. So what happens in, uh, in what's the timeline in Maersk uh, for this event? So as you see here, um, actually internally, uh, our team in Latin American, actually they are initially started reporting the, the declining water levels of um, Panama Canal since uh, February uh, last year. And also on, uh, on April 26, they escalated the issue because they suddenly noticed that uh, uh, last year, the drought situation is in actually a little bit abnormal. It's even worse than the normal patterns. It's a declining faster and also more severe. So uh, they escalated these things to the center team. And in May, we actually, uh, we actually mobilized our crisis management foresight team. So uh, please note this is a not uh, official uh, mobilized uh, the crisis management team because during that period, it's a still, uh, we still uh, f close in, uh, following the, the situations of the Panama Canal. However, business-wise, there's uh, no big, no significant impact uh, given to us at the, uh, that moment. But uh, we see that could be, uh, give a, a huge impact to operation. So that's why we mobilize uh, this uh, foresight team. So through this uh, foresight team, actually we stay closer with the, the local authority to uh, keep a close eye on the development of the situation and also including the uh, water level forecast as well to get ourselves uh, better prepared. And in August, as you see here, we actually uh, officially activate this uh, uh, crisis management team. Um, for that cases, it's a little bit special. Why we activate that only in August? Because as you see above, uh, in August, uh, suddenly these cases attract a lot of uh, media attention. So we activate our crisis management team. It's uh, mainly to address the, the increasing customer inquiries and media inquiries over the situation. So also I show the examples here is in the Merck uh, uh, customer advisory, which also you can find on Mercer.com uh, uh, today. Uh, and uh, actually it's uh, clearly says that uh, uh, we don't have any uh, impact by these uh, Panama Canal situations at the moment. So, um, but meanwhile, we also give an update, uh, ongoing updates and, uh, to our customers uh, to keep them informed about uh, the recent situation, the recent announcement from the Panama Canal authorities on their initiatives uh, to the vessel tracing uh, through the Panama Canal. And uh, after the, uh, the Red Sea crisis happened, as uh, I mentioned, there's a dual impact uh, adding on to the situations over there. So also from Merck side, we come up with the innovative, uh, uh, I would say, uh, risk mitigation solutions that we offer to customer that we call the land bridge. As you can see, the map here is actually um, uh, to have the, to use the, the rail uh, services connecting the both sides of the Panama Canal. So it's a more like for the vessels, if they have the problem or restricted to uh, transit through the Panama Canal, they can actually drop the cargoes at one side of the canal and then use the rail services and to transport to the other side. And then from the other side, there's a, a feeder uh, vessels uh, to pick up the cargoes and the further delivery to the uh, U.S. and East Coast uh, ports. 
Um, you probably will ask why this thing only comes in, in January, right? If you compare to uh, when the Red Sea, when the rerouting happened, it looks like a bit late. The, actually, in between, between the August and the January, we also imposed a lot of uh, different solutions, uh, risk mitigation solutions uh, to customers. That's including uh, the sea air solutions and the sea rail solutions using the US West code to uh, help our customer mitigate the impacts. I just uh, didn't uh, show us in here. Um, for January, when we impose the land bridge, also you can imagine Maersk as a, a, sh a shipping company and also the logistic company. From our side, before we launch this uh, initiative, we also need to prepare our fleet team as well to redesign the ocean network. You have to put it or ensure you have the vessel resources at both sides to connect and also to load the cargoes from the rail. So that's also why we actually launched this in January. But also most important, we work closely with the rail operators uh, in Panama Canal to secure the capacity, secure the space. That can also help us uh, to maximize our efforts to helping our customer. So this is an, uh, actually a simple case in, uh, to illustrate uh, the responsiveness of uh, MERSC operations against these and unexpected uh, global disruptions and also highlights our commitment to maintaining uh, supply chain continuity under any circumstances. Oh, okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah, um, maybe I can quickly uh, uh, go to the, the last two slides. Just also want to quickly show you that uh, what we have at the uh, MERSC security side. Uh, as you see here, uh, actually, um, we have the, the global security team uh, that then also uh, covers uh, the, the expert, uh, the dedicated sub, uh, specialist uh, to monitoring the threats and also managing crisis and ensuring the security of a supply chains. So uh, from the standard side, supply chain standard side, we actually adopted these uh, five standards as the picture shown here into our global supply chain security program. And for European, uh, in uh, Europe regions, uh, we also have uh, uh, our security uh, measurements uh, center the surrounding these uh, four key uh, aspects. That's including the customer centricity. We work closely uh, with uh, our customers in the solution design. And also we adopted the TAPA standards, including FSR and TSR into our uh, security uh, uh, standards in Europe. And we actually pushing for the certifi certifications in here. And uh, uh, also we work closely with uh, some uh, industries and um, organizations uh, to develop the standards, like the examples I show here for pharmaceuticals. Uh, we actually apply our knowledge in the pharmaceutical uh, uh, business, uh, trans especially in the transportation side. We actually work with, some, uh, with the organization called uh, uh, Validite to develop the security standards for uh, the ocean and the inland transport for pharmaceutical uh, cargoes. So uh, I think that's all for my presentation today. Uh, thank you very much and, uh, for your attention. Uh, I hope uh, that you find uh, the information uh, offer some value to you. Also, if you have any questions, I will be around uh, uh, in the event uh, for the whole day. And uh, here also I shared my uh, LinkedIn contacts. Besides, uh, we also have our European security team also here. We have uh, Ms. Leoni Busi, so she's a uh, European uh, security uh, regional hat and uh, also uh, he's the as you probably many of you know her as the uh, the the member of the the tapa uh, emia board here so if you have any specific uh, questions about security also you can find us here thank you very much <laughs>